symposium pre-conference, which we're calling Inclusive SciComm Foundations. My name is Sunshine Menezes. I am Executive Director of the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute. On behalf of all of us at Metcalf Institute and the 2021 Inclusive SciComm Symposium Planning Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's symposium. The symposium is hosted by Metcalf Institute, which is headquartered on the ancestral lands of the Narragansett and Eastern Niantic people. Their lands originally encompassed what is now the state of Rhode Island, Eastern Connecticut, and Southern Massachusetts. I encourage you to watch our welcome video on the symposium platform for an extended version of this land acknowledgement. We feel it is important to recognize that this land was stolen. And while our institution, the University of Rhode Island, has far to go to meaningfully address this history of land grabbing, genocide, and racialized injustice, we have begun to take some steps that we hope will lead to even more concrete actions in the very near future. This symposium is a small part of the process of social and structural transformation these acknowledgments require. Indeed, the, SICOMS, the Inclusive SICOM Symposium is an opportunity for all of us to build our networks and learn and unlearn together. To that end, the planning committee selected themes this year that allow us to focus on the widely shared need for action, beginning with the three sessions featured in today's pre-conference. We ask everyone to abide by the Symposium Code of Conduct, which you can read on inclusivesicom.org. Should you have any concerns about misconduct, please contact the organizers by sending an email to conduct at metcalfinstitute.org and we will respond immediately. Please look for ASL in the screen names to know which of our presenters will be doing ASL interpretation today. Thank you to Manny Jade Garcia and Gloshanda Lawyer for their interpretation and to Kelly S for doing the live captions. Finally, we thank the many generous sponsors of this year's Inclusive SciComm Symposium and ask that you visit the sponsors page on the symposium platform to learn more about them. And now it is my great pleasure to turn this program over to our session hosts. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for a great introduction. And um, thank you to everyone for attending our session. Um, so uh, there is transcription available. If it's not turned on for you, you can go to the CC live transcript button and um, it will give you the option to turn it on. Um, and if it is on and you don't want it on, it will also give you the option to hide it. Um, so to start today, uh, Thank you again for attending. My name is Linda Corcoran and um, myself and my uh, co-facilitators, Sarita, Amanda and Alyssa will be presenting this roundtable. Um, before we started, we just wanted to give a very quick note on disability language. So disability language can vary from culture to culture and it can vary across the world and also across languages. But for us, we very much use what is known as identity first language. So we say disabled person over person first language is in person with a disability. So that is how we will be referring to ourselves um, today. Uh, you can feel free to use disabled person or person with a disability. If you want to use a question, that is our preference but both are valid. Um, we will say that disability euphemisms are not generally accepted by the disability community, as in special abilities, specially abled, that sort of thing. So we would prefer if non-disabled people would not use them. Thank you very much. And I think Amanda, would you like to go next? <laughs> Yeah, so to begin um, our roundtable session this morning, we're all just going to begin by uh, introducing ourselves and telling you a little bit about our backgrounds. So I'll go ahead and begin. My name is Amanda Klingler. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I, um, by uh, trade, what I do is I am a behavioral ecologist. I'm interested in anthropogenic change and how it impacts animal behavior. Um, I am also a disabled woman. So I have um, several, um, 
autoimmune diseases as well as um, an immune deficiency, uh, among other things. And that has shaped uh, my experience in science and also my experience as a science communicator. Um, uh, for many years, I was employed at Brookfield Zoo uh, near Chicago, where I grew up as um, an interpreter. Uh, and so I have uh, had experiences um, both as um, a student in the sciences and as a science communicator to the public. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Illinois State University um, and I was a first generation student, um, which is something that also shaped my experience in addition to my disabilities. Um, and I was really fortunate throughout my undergraduate career, career to do two different um, research experience for undergraduate programs um, funded by the National Science Foundation at Georgetown University and UC Berkeley. Uh, and my current position is that I am a second year graduate student at UCLA. Uh, and so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sarita so that she can introduce herself. Thank you so much, Amanda, and it is my honor to be here today. So once again, my name is Sarita Nolan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and my disability pronouns are neurodivergent, invisibly disabled, and disabled woman. And I am currently finishing my undergrad, 19 years it's taken to get to finishing my human health psychology bachelor's. But in everything that I have done through my higher education, I've only realized in these last few years that I count that I'm valid as a disabled woman. I am Black, I am Indigenous, I am bisexual, I am a disabled woman, and my passions lie towards getting my PhD in health or public policy to transform the mental health field through comprehensive preventative strategies like we have in any other health area across our lifespan and also transforming disability inclusion through a lot of my nonprofit efforts with disabled and higher ed, health advocate acts and many others. So thank you for having me here. And with that, I will pass it to Linda. Awesome. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Linda Corcoran and I am a master's student in food science in Ireland. Um, my background is pretty much always been in food science. I focus currently in sensory science and um, how we perceive food and think about it. And um, I have always been very interested in science communication. And the more I got involved in it, the more I found that it is hard to access it, both as a disabled person wanting as a scientist, but also on the public side of it. And um, that kind of spur made me want to do a lot of things to improve that. And um, I am a disabled non-binary person. I have multiple disabilities. Uh, probably the ones I talk about the most are my cognitive ones and um, autism, ADHD, um, various mental illnesses. And um, yeah, that's an introduction to me. Uh, Alyssa, you're next. Hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa Paparella. My pronouns are she, her. I grew up in New Jersey, and then I'm first generation. I pursued my college degree at Sarah Lawrence College in New York. I graduated in 2019 with my degree. Then I went on to do the National Institute of Health prep program. So that's a post back program for underrepresented minorities in STEM. So that also includes disabled identities. Um, right now, I'm currently at Baylor College of Medicine. I'm in the cancer and cell biology program. I'm a second year, and I'm also the founder of Disabled in STEM on Twitter. And with that, that's a good introduction to me. And I'm gonna pass it on for our first question to discuss. Awesome. Um, so I guess our first question is, what are the barriers that each of us and anyone in the chat who would like to get involved have faced in pursuing higher education and science communication as a disabled person? Um, I guess uh, to start with myself, the barriers have it mainly been that people don't believe that disabled people exist here. So if I am here, I am clearly lying about my disability. Um, this has happened quite a lot. Um, people get very, uh, there's a lot of distrust and also a lot of saying, well, you're not really disabled. Uh, you're not really 
autistic autistic that doesn't uh <laughs> make any sense but i hear it a lot and um they a lot of people think that we are just looking for an easy way out when we ask for accommodations when we ask for access when we ask that things be made accessible in a way that they're not usually used to doing um and um Alyssa, would you like to go next Sure. So as you guys could assume, there are many barriers that we have faced, but one that I've specifically experienced is finding so many barriers just to be involved in science in general. So like I had mentioned, I was able to participate in a prep program. So that was for underrepresented minorities, but even being and disclosing my disability in my applications, I had people who interviewed me and were like, but how do you identify because I am a white woman? So it's like, how are you part of diversity? So their interpretation, even though the rules say disability is not something they were actually actively thinking about. So opportunities that need to exist for inclusion of disabled people. Another thing is um, National Science Foundation research experience for undergraduates. There is one specifically at University of Delaware and it exists for people with disabilities. That was my first experience getting into research. And if I didn't have that opportunity, I'm not sure I would be where I am today. It was the only way that I was able to get into a lab because otherwise as a disabled person, PIs tend to feel that you're a liability, which you're not. So if we're able to have more inclusive environments that allow for disabled individuals to partake in STEM, STEM would be much more inclusive and a much better place. So with that, I'm willing to pass it on to Amanda. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, yeah, I think I, I echo a lot of what Linda said um, in that uh, requesting accommodations is often really difficult because disability uh, is a taboo subject that is something that um, is meant to not be talked about, is meant to not be kept private. Um, I view disability as a part of my identity that is equally worth celebrating as any other part of my identity would be. Um, but unfortunately, many people don't see it that way. Um, and they view it, um, as Alyssa mentioned, as, as a liability or a burden. Um, and I think one thing that I've encountered um, kind of being on the other side of thinking about science communication programming is that um, there's definitely a lot of resistance to like, why do we need to have these extra accessibility efforts, right? Like what, because it's costly to have captions and to have ASL interpreters and do these things, right? Um, and I've heard the justification a lot that it's like, well, disabled people don't come here. Disabled people don't do these things, but um, disabled people are 25% of the population, right? And if they're not coming to your, your events or engaging with your work, it's because it's not accessible, right? If, if there is no caption, how would they how would they know what you've said, right? And so um, I think a really big barrier is just removing the idea that disability is something that is to be hidden um, so that it can be more visible, just the sheer amount of disabled people that, that you encounter every day so that we can start to implement accessibility as something that is standard practice rather than an extra or an afterthought in our, in our work and in our interactions with each other. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it on to Sarita. Thank you so much, Amanda. And disability is a part of our lives as well. And there's a lot of time that will pass through from having first symptoms to being diagnosed. I was diagnosed with my ADHD last year, and I did not realize that was part of why I always watch movies and things like that with captions, because they really help me out a lot. So really being open to learning and broadening your awareness of it's not always just those who are asking for it who need the accommodations. Like some of the biggest barriers I've experienced is not knowing that I've had ADHD, but also 19 years from my undergrad and no disabled mentors until I made it to disability Twitter. No undergraduate research programs that were focused on disability. I'm an Ignair scholar last year and participated in psychology honors two months till my thesis is due. And I don't think any of that was focused on me as a disabled student. Actually, there was a lot of ableism through my programs in trying to correct me as, oh no, it's not like a disabled woman, it's woman with disability. I'm like, okay, no psychology department, you can't fix, you can't tell me what's right, what my pronouns are, just as much as I can't tell you what your gender pronouns are. I've been pushed out of labs because my PI didn't know how to like accommodate and make a get a pipetter that took less force. 
I'd been rejected from my grad school. Um, one was like confused between, am I more interested in advocacy or research? But it's both. You have to advocate your, for yourself when you're applying to programs. You have to advocate for your research. And this is how we gatekeep higher education and science, science communication is also gatekept because as communications co-chair for the American Public Health Association, and I see very little SciComm, very little graphics that are actually accessible. And that's heartbreaking because 25% of the population does not have access to critical public health information about COVID and so many other things. So with that, I'd like to take us to our next question of what actions could be taken to remove some of the barriers that we've discussed prior and to continue a little bit, like it's just having this willingness to learn as well. Because when I use an alt text bot, because alt text is just like, basically what do you see in an image and describing it? So there's no cited privilege blocking information that they have. So I'm looking at alt text bots that say no alt text. I share a little bit about what alt text is. And it's like, they're not listening. They don't want to change. They never reply. And I check back on posts in the future and I still don't see any alt text, any or orienting to that image. And disability advocates are doing this unpaid and we should be respected. We should be listened to. We should be seen as people that can help you learn more about accessibility rather than someone that's just annoying you or bothering you or something like that because sometimes it does feel like that and really normalizing deleting and reposting accessibly is the most important thing in twitter accessibility for SciComm. so with that i'll pass it to linda yeah so um i guess the main action is commitment um actually committing to accessibility and i guess we, we are going to talk about barriers as well but one of our main barriers is that people don't know society has not prepared anyone to make content accessible to do this accessibly so you need to commit and you need to commit to learning commit to making sure that things are accessible if you are organizing that you are organizing something that is accessible that it isn't an option to have an event without accessibility it isn't an option to post your graphics without the alt text it has to be done either it's all and some people think this is a bit all or nothing but if you want true access it has to be all or nothing because either everyone can access it or you might as well not be doing it because it's not equitable that is that's kind of it um Alyssa <laughs> I think one of the important things is having allies for the disability community. As Sayrita mentioned, we have time where we have to go through text and messages on Twitter to make sure that they're accessible. And that's something that we tend to do during our free time. But I mean, that is limited as a disabled individual. We have higher demands of rest and medical care. So we are still doing this work where allies, once they learn about it, they could also help and prove their commitment to empowering the disability community. So I think another important part of understanding allies role here is understanding that disability is part of diversity conversations because it tends to be not part of the conversation at all. So once we recognize that disability serves to be at the table then we could start moving towards actual change and within disability it's in itself, it's important to realize that disability is very diverse two people's needs, they may have the same diagnosis, but accommodations may differ because it's an individual process. So just because you know a single person with say a diagnosis of ADHD, these accommodations may look different. So allies need to recognize it's not a one solution fits all, it's an individual process that needs to be worked out with the one specific person. So being able to recognize that allies role plays a very important part in how disabled individuals can get ahead will definitely help to break down some of these barriers. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Amanda. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what Alyssa said that I think a hugely important step that all of us can begin to take is normalizing 
disability as an identity and understanding the way that that identity um, is fluctuating and dynamic, just like with other identities. And I think um, like we now do with other identities, such as gender identity, not making assumptions about people's disability status, right? So I think a lot of the times um, I, um, you know, there's an interesting conversation to be had about like the term invisible versus visible disabilities, right? But um, for now, I'll just say that I am not visibly disabled um, to, in a way that abled people in society would like readily recognize, right? And so I've had many instances where like doing science communication jobs in outdoor settings where people are like, oh, like you're young and healthy, like you can help me move this box. Like they, they say things that end up being microaggressions, right? Or like they criticize like the way that you walk or the way that you do something or your inability to do something, right? Um, just because they, they make an assumption that because I'm a young woman, I am therefore likely um, healthy, right? And not disabled. Um, and so I think recognizing disability as an identity not assuming people's um, disability status so that we are not inadvertently, you know, having those microaggressive conversations with people in um, like interpersonal interactions, but especially not in um, science communication related interactions. Um, and then as um, Linda said, also making basic accommodation and accessibility practices standard, right? And, you know, I think Linda really hit that point, so I won't go over it again. But one thing I want to highlight is that if it is not okay and it is not equitable to say that it is available upon request. If somebody has to do the work to request access or accommodation, that is not equitable, right? Like if I have to ask for you to include me, if I have to ask for an accommodation, if I have to take time out of my day to like prove my diagnosis and file paperwork with an office for my like bodily needs to be met and respected when an abled person does not, that is not access, right? And that is not okay. And recognizing that disability is dynamic um, and accommodations are necessary um, and being ready for that and, and um, accepting that as it comes. Um, and I think that that'll go a long way towards making disability uh, something that is more included and accommodated for in our efforts. So with that, it brings us to our next question is what issues do we foresee in removing some of these barriers? So one issue that's important is talking about the cost. So as we've kind of mentioned a bit before is that people tend to say, oh, we don't need to have interpreters. Are there really that many disabled people there? So having the cost, some people try to rationalize as an issue with including disabled people. So that's just from a digital perspective. But then also when we move to the lab side of it, labs are often set up to not be accessible. If you think back to a lab that you've worked in or seen, you may be thinking of the high top benches. How could somebody in a wheelchair access that? That is not a safe environment for them. And it was built maybe before ADA, so the American with Disability Act, and it may not have been thought to be inclusive back then. But we're in 2021 now, so we want to kind of see some change is to make these environments much more inclusive, but that's going to come at a cost because you have to take away the inaccessible equipment and make it accessible again. So the cost is definitely one issue that I foresee being a barrier, but at the end of the day, disabled people deserve to have access and belong in those spaces. We're talking 20 to 25 percent of the world's population with the COVID pandemic and long COVID. This may even increase in years to come and Everybody deserves equal access, so the cost is worth it in the end. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Amanda. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, yeah, I completely agree with the cost. And I think, um, like touching back on some of the things that we talked about earlier, I think there's a lot of cultural resistance to the idea that disability is a part, a valid part of identity, and that disabled people are like worth it you know they are like a worthy target audience you know going back to what i said earlier you know i've been in science communication spaces where like the the answer is like oh like, we don't have the budget for that but that's okay because wheelchair users don't come here or um deaf people do not engage with this programming and it's like well 
how could they ever have? Like if they cannot get in the door, if they cannot understand what you're saying, how could they have ever been a target audience for your work, right? And I think, um, frankly, it's quite dehumanizing as a disabled person to be told that you are not worth the money and the effort, right? Like I think if we can spend money on like snacks for abled people, I think that we could spend money to have a ramp so that wheelchair users um, can access the building, right? And I think um, it's a matter of rearranging priorities. And I think, reconceptualizing um, the idea that people have of disability, right, um, as something that is very diverse um, and that dis the disability is, um, I don't know, it's more common than you would think. And I think also that like disabled people are people. Like I don't know how else to articulate it, but I think there's an idea that disabled people are not full people, right? And like I've heard a lot of justification, particularly in like the zoo community, that it's like, oh, like this disabled person will have like a caregiver with them. So like you can interface with their caregiver. Like I don't have a caregiver. I don't need like I, you know, and even if somebody does have a caregiver, that doesn't mean that you should not recognize their humanity and interface with that, right? And so I think just getting people over that that mental hurdle of like the idea of internalized ableism that like Disabled people are people that are worthy of being included in spaces and they are worth the time and the money and the energy just as much as any other human being, um, which is, you know, unfortunate, but I think that that's the state of where we're at right now. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it on to Sarita. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I want to really build off of that because when you get the intersection of being disabled and a woman being disabled and black, it can become this compounded bear burden that's even so much more different where sometimes I still feel like maybe we're living in the days where black disabled people are still three-fifths of a person like do we still hold value like the impact of racism and ableism can come together in a way that makes it more challenging and I really wish that resource centers that supported like Black people, women, LGBTQ community, they have resources because it's in the name of their centers, but they don't utilize those resources to help those who are disabled in their community for fear sometimes that it takes away from their message about the LGBTQ community, women, but whatever it is, we don't take away, it adds. It creates space for those who are diagnosed, undiagnosed, because health inequities are real. and just dealing with health inequities and inequities in education, structural ableism and internalized ableism, and this medical model of disability that runs higher education, it makes it hard for a disabled mentor to feel comfortable disclosing. And then since we have this medical model of disability, you can't really match a disabled student as easily to a disabled mentor at any level. And it becomes placed on us to create our own mentoring programs like disabled STEM, disabled in higher ed, disabled docs, and APHA disability all have mentoring programs that are created for disabled people by disabled people because no one's doing it for us. And accessibility feels like an afterthought, not only in STEM, but in science communication. Because again, as Amanda said, it doesn't seem like disability is seen as a worthy audience when we're the most important of all, because anything that's involving in science and health is affecting us in a much different, greater way than any other community. And with that, I will pass it to Linda. Great, thank you so much, Sarita. Um, so I kind of touched on it before, but a massive, massive barrier is lack of knowledge, as has been highlighted by, I think, everyone else, society is massively ableist society is hugely everything is and, and people say i say this too much but everything can go can be traced back to eugenics and um <laughs> it, it's it's true it, the ableism and also with a lot of the other bigotry that comes with it has formed a society where we see disabled people as an afterthought as optional inclusion as um, basically people that should be hidden away. And um, all of this very much comes up to nobody knowing how to do it. So we do need to have this training, but also training takes time and more money, but this is absolutely very, very important. 
And um, I guess with that, we are going to end our part of it to make sure that we have enough time for people to give their opinions and to talk about it and hopefully find some solutions to all of these barriers and see what can happen. Awesome.